All right, do I have to put on my teacher's hat? I'm hearing talking out there. We're, the music is done. All right, sounds good. Uh, why did the farmer win the Nobel Peace Prize? Why did the farmer win the Nobel Peace Prize? You know who who who's those? I know. Oh, you know. Well, I'll let you say. Because he was outstanding in the field. That's true. Very, very true. <laughs> two points. Two points for you. <laughs> oh, to me? Oh, okay. Hopefully that won't do that anymore. Maybe I ought to take it out. Russ, will you take my coat and hang it up? Normally it, it doesn't <laughs> ring. <clears throat> we do have announcements for this morning. Uh, I uh, know that uh, the big thing is that, at least that I'm trying to push, is that we're having our Advent devotional that we're trying to put together. Um, one of the big questions that was asked of me last week that if I'm going to write this, does it have to be about Christmas or does it have to be about Advent? And she was wanting to write about her recovery from cancer. And I said, that's totally appropriate. If, yours, if there's something, the truth about God that you want to, and it's not necessarily related to Christmas or Advent, it, it doesn't mean it's going to be excluded. We want your personal input in this. And I think even when you look at the devotional material that we have, when it comes to Christmas time, it isn't always, it isn't 28 days of, of Christmas stuff. There's other things that are in there as well. Sure, there's some that are Christmas related, but if you have something that you just want to say and you've got some scripture to back it up and you've got, you know, a good story to back it up and it doesn't have to be long and you don't have to type out the scripture, but include it and it will, we, will, we will use it. Now, I know that Pastor Rob said that he had a, uh, a writer's workshop. If you're interested um, and you want to be to do something, but you want some help with it, uh, he's doing a writer's workshop, and he's doing it at his church. There's times, there's two times that he's doing it, and I wrote it down. It's in my car. Perfect place for an announcement, right? So, but if you want to know what it is, I can get it for you after church. Uh, I know he's got a morning time and an evening time that, that he's going to do it this Wednesday. Uh, and he did say he would be willing to have uh, something at one or both of our churches. So if you're interested in that, please feel free to, to uh, let me know and we can set you up with that information. Um, also be aware of, and I like to start doing this several weeks in advance because I never know when people are going to go on vacation and that kind of thing, but November 5th is, guess what? It is... Nash, it is the uh, daylight savings time, so be aware of daylight savings time and, and don't be late because it's fall back. And um, I never quite can get that. Does that mean I'm going to be early for church or late for church? But either way, it's fall back, so you set your clock back. Um, other announcements is, is that we have uh, pastor lunch with pastor on Friday. Uh, we usually go to the depot. Um, last time I was there all by myself. So if you want to come uh, and you don't want me to have lunch by myself, uh, feel free to come. I'll even let Robert come if he wants to come. Good. Oh. <laughs> I'll think about that. <laughs> so, um, but there are uh, other things. Uh, let me see. 
Bible study is at 7 p.m. This week we're going to be doing it uh, at Hillman Church. If you want to join us, it'll be at Hillman Church. It'll be episode four of The Chosen. And it has been an interesting interpretation on, so far, the early ministry of Jesus Christ. And um, it, it, things, it pulls from the Bible, and we have looked into the Bible and found the, the different things that we know that were in there, but it, it kind of fills in some of the blanks and what it must have been like for Matthew, who was a tax collector, and what it must have been like for Mary Magdalene, who dealt with uh, demon possession. And it must have been, you know, what it was like for the kids and the people and, and maybe some things that Jesus must have had to go through. And um, it's not all biblical, but it's not against the Bible either. So if you want to see that and you, you want to be entertained, then you're more welcome to come. It'll be at 7 on at Hillman. But also bring your Bible, because I am still calling this a Bible study, and we do spend time flipping through the pages and seeing what we can suss out about what the director was trying to say here or, or what we feel about certain parts. So feel free to, to come with that. And I know that was a big sell, but I, I think it's a good series and it's worthy to see. Um, we are having on the 29th the fall cleanup. If you're interested in, in helping out with that, uh, that is uh, going to be happening here at the end of the month, and then we're going to be doing the trunk or treat. Uh, we do want to have participation in that. I don't know, did we have a sign-up sheet for that? We do? We have a few. We would like more. So um, I'm definitely planning... I already bought my, my pumpkin shirt, and I have a, a cape. I don't know what it is that I'm going to be, but it's probably something Halloween-y. So, um, we'll, but uh, just keep that in your mind. Yes? Pastor, would you mind explaining what trunk or treat is? Trunk or treat? Um, basically, it's an alternative for kids uh, for kids instead of going house to house we park in the parking lot, we open up our back trunk, we decorate the back trunk, uh, we dress up, and then we pass out candy for the kids, and they go between the different cars. Um, some people will not decorate their car, and they'll bring a little table and decorate the table. Some people go all out on it. Uh, some people do it very simply, and, and that's uh, okay either way, but it's just the idea of having a time for the kids to go somewhere safe, have a, have a fun time. Um, I don't think we've got any other activities in association with it, but um, I know that we're planning it on a day where we should have a lot of participation. So I hope that answered your question. Yeah, thank you. I, I wasn't familiar okay. So are you coming as Superman or... The Michelin Man? Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not going there. <laughs> um, but anyway, that's going on. And also know that on the 6th of November uh, is All Saints Day. There is a sign-up sheet back there. If you want your loved ones remembered on that day, I encourage you to uh, sign up there. We'll get you their names in the bulletin for that Sunday. Um, it'll probably be up until the Sunday before, and then after that, I can't guarantee that it'll get into the bulletin um, if you call during the week, but certainly uh, we will take names at any time. So keep aware of those things. Um, any other announcements? Yes. Yes.
And that being said, maybe Jody can help. This is this uh, young lady over here is Jody Flessner. She is the district superintendent. Um, if you haven't met her, I'm sure she would be willing to to uh, introduce herself to you. But I'm I'm already done that. So uh, if you want to say hi, she's here. Um, she may have something. We are doing a a fundraiser too this afternoon. Yes. Correct. And that's Warner, the one that we support, right? Yeah. Um, Russ? Wilson. 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 Wilson School. I keep wanting to go Warner, but I it's Wilson. So that's, it'll, half will go to Wilson, and then half will go to the Leaders for Readers, which is more of a international thing. But if you want to make a donation to that, if you want to come, uh, please do. Uh, it, it will be informative. Uh, you will learn a lot about the church. Uh, it's at 2 o'clock, the, the business meeting, which will be just us and Hillman. Um, we traditionally do it together. Uh, and then there will be uh, a time where all the churches, Alpena, um, Ossonique, Lincoln, and Harrisville, will all be together, and we'll probably do that in here. So... Uh, it will be a good time of fellowship as well. You'll be able to see people in your area that are fellow United Methodists, and uh, that's also good as well. Is there any other announcements that I need to speak to that I may have forgotten? Yes. Who is the pastor Rob who you referred to about writing? Rob Nystrom is the new pastor as of July in Alpena First Church. The new pastor in uh, the three churches in Alcona is uh, Pastor Reeves. And, uh, but I may not have mentioned him before now. But just in case you're wondering, now you know. So I'm the old guy of our, th our trio. That, that's kind of a weird thing too, right? <laughs> Uh, no answers, especially from you, Glenn. We know that you're going to say something. Uh, any other announcements? Nothing? Okay. Do we have somebody? Oh, yeah. Russ and I have a deal. He's going to do the call to worship, and then I'm going to do the, the reading. Right? Yeah. Oh, celebration of birthdays. Yeah, you, you, you need to catch me on that. Uh, last week we got Bob. Um, we didn't do Jonathan Barton, but uh, we did celebrate somebody's birthday earlier today, and I think we're going to do it again because, you know, she's in a whole new setting. <laughs> so, yeah, you don't have to get a year older just by going from one church to the other, but. We, we do want to celebrate your birthday here yeah, as well. I, even, I was afraid to do this. I even got my little money on here for your song. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> uh, and we didn't play the piano for her, so we're not going to do that for her here too. So uh, we'll just do it a cappella. A cappella. Uh, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you and many more. 
So, uh, and then Tom and Sandy, we'll catch you at another time. So, or uh, Sally Sandy, as we like to call her. Um, now we can do the call to reading, or call to worship. Good morning, Spratt Church. If you could please stand as you're able and join me in the call to worship. I will read the light print if you could please respond with the bold print. God, beyond all praising, we worship you today and sing the love amazing that songs cannot repay. We lift our hearts before you and wait upon your word. And if you could turn your hymnals to page 98 for the opening hymn. couple weeks ago when we had communion Sunday? Were you here for that? Do you remember what Sunday that was? It was a special communion Sunday. World communion Sunday. Do you remember what World Communion Sunday was about? Same day every time. Yeah, you guys weren't here for that, were you? No. Well, today is kind of in a way, sort of maybe a day where we are connected with the bigger church. In fact, I would say, really, we are. 
It's a day that we kind of celebrate that makes us connected with the bigger church. Not the world, but certainly a bigger part. And this lady right here has a lot to do with it. She is Jody Flessner, and she is the district superintendent. She is in charge of many of the churches, not just the, the, the churches that I mentioned here, but you, gotta, you got your map of Michigan? You got it and look at it? You know where Alpena is? Right up there. Somewhere right around right there. Kind of right on the thing. And we're kind of just inside of that a little bit. So you know what churches she's in charge of, and I know this is kind of a generality, but if you take everything from here on up, that's pretty much what she's in charge of. So if there's churches, I don't know, give me some names of churches that... 75 of them. 75 of them. I know Traverse City is one. I think they're... Huh? Ludington. Ludington. Manton, I know, is one. Manton, Gaylord, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So she's in charge of a lot. And when, we, when she comes here and we do our church conference, it is a lot about celebrating who we are as a church, who we are as a Spratt United Methodist Church, but it also connects us to all of those other churches because she's here. And part of what I want you to do, is this isn't kind of a biblical truth, but it is a church truth, and it is important when you are part of the United Methodist Church to know who you are as United Methodists. And Jody is kind of the, the support person that I have, and she helps out for, uh, with issues in the church and, and different things and, and helps connect us to things that are important even things that involve you guys. So there is things that go on in our conference that's for you guys. Well, maybe not that young. I don't know. Do you have camping, camping and different things like that? We have, a, we have a person who works with Sunday school teachers across the state. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this is, that's part of what I want you guys to know, is to know that you are not only part of the world church, but there is an important part of this part of Michigan. So when you think about that, there is DSs that are down in this area and different other parts too. But she is the one that is ours. Did you have anything that you wanted? No, nope. do you guys have any questions? No? no. What would you ask, right? Right, right, <laughs> throw you on the spot, right? Yeah. So anyway, uh, I'm glad that you guys are here, and I know she's glad, and I know everybody here is glad. So let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Lord, I just thank you for these kids that are here this morning, and I thank you for, for Rhonda and all the teachers that are involved with them, dear Lord, and I just pray that you be with them. Help them to, to grasp a hold of a truth, a nugget of truth about who you are, not just in the Bible, but to know who you are as United Methodists and know that that is a valuable thing to you, God, that you smile on a church who serves you. And we pray and we ask that we continue to serve you and that we continue to love you in the ways that we know that you, that make you happy. And I just thank you, dear Lord, for these people, these kids this morning, and that you bless them and, and help them in all the ways that you, that we know you do. In your name, amen. And also, I'd like to do something else. I, I get neglectful about doing this, but I'd like to do this with you guys. Can you do the Lord's Prayer with me? Uh, we'll, we'll, there you go, yeah. And we'll all say it together, so it won't be just you guys, okay? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So if you don't know it, that's why I like doing it, so that you have a chance to say it. So it looks like, Rhonda, are you feeling okay? Well, they're ready for you. And they're wondering if you're okay. Thank you. So do we have joys and concerns this morning? At the other church, we do it before the service starts, but here we do it during the service. So is there any, any prayers or any... Be in, be in prayer for Lyle Ames. Some of you may know him. He went into the hospital this week. I'm sure Sherry would, would appreciate your prayers. She, he's from the other church. Oh, and uh, for those of you that may not know, um, or those of you that, well, know and not know, my mom last week called me. She went into the hospital because she was passing blood. She is on the recovery, but I appreciate your prayers. Um, she ended up having colitis, um, but, you know, my grandmother died of, of, uh, of uh, cancer down there, so it was, it was a big concern, but she's doing much better now, so I appreciate your prayers continue to her. Yes? It's a hip. Hip, hip. Yeah. Yep. Any other prayers or praises this morning? Robert, how are you doing? Your dad? I mean, all of that is all going okay? Yeah. You can do that. Skyler, I remembered. Not Tyler. Huh? Not Tyler. Not Tyler. <laughs> Any others? Okay. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, we thank you for your presence this morning. I ask that your spirit come down this morning and that the the spirit of learning and, and softening our hearts is, is present, dear Lord, and that we, we gain a truth about who you are. I ask that you be with us this morning in the prayer requests that we have and the, the, the brokenness of spirit that we sometimes run across in our lives, dear Lord, that you be in those situations and, and help us to recover. <clears throat> I pray for those that are about to go off into medical procedures, <coughs> that you be with them, that you be uh, with Ethan and Skyler, that you bless them and their, the prep that they are doing for their, their new steps in life, dear Lord, and I just ask that you be with them as well. If there are prayer requests that have not been brought Forth, that you be with those prayers, that you be with the hearts of those who pray them. I ask that you be in parts of the country and the world that are dealing with weather-related issues, Florida certainly, and Haiti that is dealing with all kinds of crime and violence as a result of what's going on there, and, and reports that we hear in Pakistan and Ukraine and, and all over the world, dear Lord, where there's things that are strife and, and, and just people that are dealing with things that are unimaginable. I ask, dear Lord, that you be in those situations. And I ask, dear Lord, that you remind us to be thankful for being in a place where we are not having to deal with that. That you are, are blessing us with a time of 
of relative peace and, and joy compared to some of the things that we hear about. Because that's important too. We ask you, Lord, that you be in those situations of those people around the world and those people here locally and those people in this church. I thank you, dear Lord, for all that you do, all that you are, and all that you ask us to be. In your precious name, amen. Now, I made a deal with Russ, because he's kind of playing several roles this morning. And I said I would read the scripture this morning. And, uh, and I knew what I was walking into, 30 verses of Daniel, Daniel 3, 1 through 30. And it's a story about Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, and three other guys. I'm giving this sermon because it speaks to me, and I think that it will speak to other guys as well. I, my heart, when I saw this topic, was for the guys, because I think in this world today, we have pressures on us that are asking us to do things and be things that are not of God. And I know that in doing that and in those pressures that we have, sometimes we just choose to either give in or ignore our Christian faith. Because sometimes it feels like God is asking us to do things and we just don't get that support. Well, this morning, consider supported that you are being recognized. And though I'm speaking primarily to myself and then to the guys in this community, know that I understand that the things that I say for the men in this, in this church, it is applicable for the women as well. But my heart is for the men this morning. And if you don't feel that you are getting a message out of this, then know that probably sometimes it isn't for you. Sometimes the message is for you and it isn't for somebody else. And that is always my hope that you understand that if you don't get something out of this, that maybe somebody else is and it is important to pray for them. But in that, I want to read what is in Daniel 3, 1 through 30. King Nebuchadnezzar, and I'm going to, to cut through some of the extra words because this is a pretty wordy uh, reading. But King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 60 cubits high, which is about 90, 90 uh, feet high, and six cubits wide, which is about nine feet wide, and it sets up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, the perfects, the governors, the advisors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, the perfects, the governors, the advisors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image of King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So you get the idea of why I'm going to cut some of this down. And they stood before it. And the heralds loudly proclaimed the nations and the people of every language, this is what you are commanded to do as soon as you hear the sounds of the horn, the fruit, and all the flute, and all the other instruments, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down, the, worship will, and the worshipers will immediately be thrown into the blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sounds of the, fruit, the flute and the horn and the other instruments, all the nations and the people of every language fell down and worshiped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. 
At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, may the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, and all these other instruments must fall down and worship the image of gold. And whatever and whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into the blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who paid no attention to you. Your majesty, they neither serve your God nor worship the image of gold that you had set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, it is true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up. Now then, you hear the sound of the horn, the, fruit and the, the flute, and the other instruments of all kinds of music. If you are ready to fall down and worship the image I have made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this manner. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And we and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent that the fur and the furnace was so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, Weren't there three men tied up and thrown into the fire? They replied, Certainly, your majesty. He said, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like the son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come out here now. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, perfects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair on their head singed, their war their robes were not scorched, and there was no fire, smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who had sent his angels and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's commands and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who says anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. And that is the word of God for the people of God. The idea of here that there is fire. And we're going to be talking about two kinds of fire this morning. 
But what happens in this story is something that I feel relates to me, and I think it relates to men in general, and that's where my heart is this morning, is the, the, the fact that men get asked to do things, and they're asked to, to perform and be and, and do and to be uh, certain kinds of men, ones of ambition. I know there's that show, and I forget what it's called, but it's, it's got the men of the 50s, and it kind of talks about how, how, they're, how being ambitious is supposed to be good for them, and, and how moving forward in the company and moving forward in the world is something that men should do, and that you are not really successful if you're not doing that. The world asks us to do things that may not be godly always in nature. If you are not being successful and you are not achieving and you are not walking over the fellow office people and the fellow workers and being successful, then you are not quite somehow being what you should be. In the midst of all of that, like I said, fire is the example here. And there are two kinds of fire that I'll be talking about this morning. The fire that is, comes from the pressures of the world to make us conform, and the fire that's on the inside that comes from our desire to serve God. The whole thing starts with this image that King Nebuchadnezzar wanted to build, or that he built and wanted people to fall down and worship. In the other church, I didn't have the opportunity to get the picture to here, but in the other church, I had a drawing of what they thought Nebuchadnezzar looked like. And there he was standing, and he was, had his hand on a desk, and there was a globe that was in his hand. And um, I think the temptation is to think that that globe was somehow the earth, but they didn't understand the world as being round at that time. But I know in my trip to Italy and Rome that oftentimes the emperors had a round globe that was in their hand and having that and holding it up and holding it in their hand somehow meant that they had power that they were men of importance. And that was an important thing to have. And indeed, in the picture, there was a young woman who was in the foreground, and she was looking at the hand and this globe that was in this picture. And it was to say that that globe was important to who Nebuchadnezzar was, that he was a man of great power and great strength. And you are to pay attention as this young woman was paying attention to this globe. And it's something that is followed throughout Roman history and the emperors, like I said, and, and this idea that having this globe was something that was powerful. And I don't know that I can tell you exactly why that is, but there is something about a globe that, that belies a certain amount of mystery to it. It is something that is not easy to make, for one thing. In, a, in the construction and in the art world, having something that's completely round is rare. And in the world, having something that is completely round is almost unnatural. Not that it is, but it just doesn't happen very often. We get rocks of all shapes and sizes, but to be perfectly round belies that there is an intelligence and there is something that is involved that helps give meaning to that object. And so an able to hold it in your hand somehow meant that it was power. And it's something that came up over and over again in my trips and in various pieces of art. And I'm sorry I didn't have that picture here for you this morning. But you get the idea. 
that this that Nebuchadnezzar had power. He had the authority to say and do what he wants, and this story is no different. And the people in the region, Babylon was a place where when they conquered people, they brought them to Babylon. And so Babylon was a place where there was a lot of different people. It wasn't just the Jewish people, and it wasn't just the Babylonians but it was the conquered people from all over the Babylonian empire. So when Nebuchadnezzar set up this golden statue of himself and expected people to start worshiping it, he said, and he had it said that you need to do and you need to worship him because he is this being of power. He thought of himself as a god. And in that thinking showed how far away from the teachings of the Jewish people he really was. Because the Jewish people at that time were understanding, and in their history, the stories of Abraham and the stories of Moses had already occurred, and God had promised that if they stay faithful to him, that he would remain faithful back. And so when they were taken to Babylon and were asked to worship other gods, they didn't do that. They remained resolute. They remembered the promises of their God. And they remembered the things that God had done for them. And they said, I am not going to bow to you because you are not the power that I recognize. And so they didn't. And the political figures that were around were noticed that these three officials who were kind of like them, kind of given places of authority within the Babylonian Empire, they said, well, these three who are Jewish people are not bowing to your authority, Nebuchadnezzar, and they are disrespecting you. And we know that Nebuchadnezzar had some favor towards these three men because it says in the scripture that his countenance changed. He went from being happy to, or being something else, to being furious with these guys. So he had changed his opinion on who these people were because he had allowed them to take positions of authority. And in doing that, he had to follow through and say, I made this decree and you are not following through with it and I am an important person and you are not recognizing that, so you are going to go into the furnace. He had the power and authority to do that and that is exactly what he did. But he had asked his most powerful of soldiers, which I find curious, You were conquered people, and you had three dissenters. Why would you need your most powerful of men to get them tied up and throw them into the fire? Maybe there was some doubt within Nebuchadnezzar's mind already. It's hard to know. But he had his most powerful soldiers tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and had them sent to the fire. And his anger was stirred up so much that it was set seven times higher than normal. And because of that, the soldiers who were the best of the best succumbed to the fire anyway. And it says in the scripture that the, 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 the ties that bind them had burned away because they were standing in the fire unbound. And they were not being consumed by this fire that had killed the strongest of his soldiers. And in Nebuchadnezzar's amazement, he looked in and he did not see but three, but four. Four men who were in this fire. Four figures. Oftentimes it is said that 
because of the way it's worded that Nebuchadnezzar was talking about Jesus. And I kind of wonder how Nebuchadnezzar, who was so far from who God was and so not Jewish, would know of a figure that was the Son of God before there was Jesus. In the theology classes that we have, there is a name for what Nebuchadnezzar saw. It was either a, 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 a the, uh, oh, I had it in my head, um, a theism that appeared like an apparition, or oh, a uh, theism that appeared in there that was an image of God, or it was a, a Christ. Uh, crystallism that had appeared and I'm struggling with the word it was it came out so easily in the last church but it those words of uh, theism and crystal Christianism uh, I, I'm sorry it's struggling with the words but anyway they are that there's either an image of God or it's an image of Jesus Christ and People believe that it could be either. And whether you believe and whether it was Jesus Christ who was there or just God, you believe in the fact that there was a power of God. And the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was there, and they had to believe that something was there with them as well. Because they had said that they believed that God would take care of them. And in the story, it was backed by the fact that they were not being consumed. That whatever was there with them was protecting them. And their faith had made them protected from that fire. The fire that was within them kept the fire from around them, from consuming them. The idea for us today is, is that we live in a world that's asking us, like King Nebuchadnezzar asked the Jewish people, to do things that are not Christ-like, that follow values that are not of Christ. And we need to realize when we are asked to do these things and the story of this the theme of this story is, is that we, if we follow Christ, he will be faithful. He will not forsaken. We know that this is something that's been important to the Jewish people because it's, it's so central to who they are. Their struggles throughout the ages of knowing that how much they're willing to give to God. And in this particular time when they are stressed and they are a conquered people and they have been taken out of their homeland, that they remember that God is there with them. And that is the way we should be when we are dealing with the pressures of this world that we not succumb to it, that we stand strong. I like the picture of, of the... Uh, lighthouse against the waves and how it stands and the waves just crash around it. But more than just standing strong against something, these three men were standing with a deity that they had worshipped, God. That they thought so highly of their God that they were not going to bow and Every other person was bowing. And we know as the story goes on, what happens? That God follows through with his promise. That he remains faithful to the faithful. And he saw that they not only were not consumed, but he changed the heart of a king. The pride of the king was broken. 
But as men who follow Christ today, we have pride. And sometimes that gets in our way. And we need to be prepared to take that risk, that sacrifice. Let the pride be set aside. Let the fear be set aside. And just go with the dance of Jesus. That thing that says, I will be different than the rest of the world. They, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were dealing with forces that were stronger than them. They were dealing with a king who was much more capable than them. But yet, in spite of all they saw, they did what they felt was right. That what they knew on the inside was right. That fire that had been set in them became strong enough to overcome that of the world. And I jumped ahead in my sermon, so I'm trying to catch up because there's a couple points I want to make in here. We need to have a real faith in God. They did not make their comments to the king for any other reason than the fact that they had the faith that they did. They knew what they were facing had a cost and they understood the consequences and they were prepared to face that pressure. They were courageous in their answers, and they needed to follow through, and they did. But what we need today are men that are just as courageous, that aren't willing to buckle and not willing to give in and not willing to just step aside. They are not shaped by the world, but by the word. They rest their lives in God's hands. This world today needs men who trust in God. They need men who are filled with the Holy Spirit, and they are men, they need men who are willing to be born again. Not sellouts. Not ones that are just absent. And as you can tell, and as I'm sure you know, it's not an easy path to take. Faith brings persecution. But the interesting flip side of that is, is that persecution brings faith. Whatever comes, total commitment is what is being asked. And that's hard to do. These men were thrown into the fire, but I don't think they felt the heat. I think because of who was in there with them, they realized that they had made the right choice. The thing that's interesting is that not only did they become saved, but the heart of the king saw the power of God. That he saw, because of their choice, he saw that they were not going to back down, but they were not acting alone. He saw four men in that fire, and that was enough to change him. And had they not made that change, 
I don't know what would have happened. If they had not stand up to who Nebuchadnezzar was, I would hate to think how this story would have ended. It certainly would not have been worth telling. Their witness had been upheld by a God who was faithful to his word, faithful to his people. In this world, there is the need to be bold. That's making a choice that is, requires us to be bold. And that is not an easy thing. I know growing up as a kid, I heard people who were so bold in Christ and it almost turned me off. I felt that it was arrogance. And I've come to the point of realizing that sometimes being bold makes us be something that we're uncomfortable in being and seeing. But there is power in being and making that kind of choice and having that kind of faith and being bold in that way. It causes a change. It triggers something in the power of Jesus Christ to change the world. Part of why I say what I'm saying this morning and I want to emphasize the fact that this makes me think of something else that uh, a, a commentator on the Bible that I particularly like, his name is David Guzik and he's also a pastor in a church out west talks about this idea of being bold and making this change and being there in that time, in that moment. And one of the things that we talk about in the ideas and the books that are in the Bible is, is that Daniel is part of that group of books that we call apocalyptic literature. That means it's literature that's about the end times. And I don't know where you are with the whole end time thing, if you're pre-millennial, post-millennial, whatever. But certainly the Bible, especially in the New and the Old Testament, talks a lot about these end times and how you choose to interpret it is really up to you. But it is important and it is an, a big idea in there that there is coming a time when we are going to be asked to make a stand. That the world is going to set up a standard, uh, a statue, and we're going to be asked to bow before it. Sometimes they call it the Antichrist, and sometimes they call it different things. Sometimes it's talked about in the sense that we have to take on a number and have it tattooed on us. But the choice is exactly what happened between Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and his, their God. That we have to make that same choice. And though the world feels like it's falling apart now, and though it feels like maybe we're inching towards whatever that end time may be, that there is still a power that is greater than anything that's going on right now. And that power is telling us, God is telling us, that if we stand with him, he will stand with us. The fire of the world is going to not overcome the fire that he has placed in us. And if we choose to be that kind of person, that he will honor it. He will make the change. And in the story, King Nebuchadnezzar changes his heart. He is a bully who changes his mind because he saw that there was a power that was greater than him. And he backed way down. And he backed way off 
on these people to the point that he even raised them up in his power structure so that their God wouldn't hurt him. That's a God who knows people, his creation. If you think some of the story is too crazy to believe, Guzik tells in his sermon that if you have trouble believing that what is going on in this story ever really happened, and I like this idea that you just, all you have to do is look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and it says there, God created. And if you can believe that, you can believe anything that follows. If you can't believe that, then you need to work on it or, or do something else because everything that we have is based off of that. Part of the theology that I like so much about the Bible is that it says that God is God and we are not. That's what makes this story so great. Because it's men who realize that they're not gods and they know where the power and the relationship goes. The fire of this world is hot but the fire of God is greater. We need men to fill that spot. And in so we need Christians who need to fill that spot because it takes all of us. But my question for you this morning is, is are you that man? Are you that person that can stand against the wave, against the heat, and know and have faith that God will be there with you. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, I thank you for these that are here this morning. I pray that you be with them and you bless them. Help them be what you need them to be. Help give them the strength and the resolve to make that choice that is the good choice. And know that like the story of the three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you will be there and you have a promise that you will stand behind. And with that, you, they will not be left behind. I thank you, dear Lord, for all that you are, all that you ask us to be, and the strength to help us to be that. In your name, amen. Let's stand. this opportunity to come before you every Sunday morning in offering you these gifts that are showings of faith of who 
we think you are. We ask, dear Lord, that we, that you bless these gifts, that you bless this church and its plans and its desire to follow you. We ask that you use this money in great and mighty ways to bring your kingdom here on earth. And we ask that you bless our efforts and help us to honor those commitments that we have. In your name, amen. Thank you. Looks like I went over maybe a little bit. I'm sorry, I didn't have anybody clearing my thro their throats like they did at the last church, and I apologize for that. Um, so if you turn to page uh, 170, uh, the hymn of dedication, Oh, How I Love Jesus. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me, it tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus! Oh, how I love Jesus! Oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in each false sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, I thank you for each person here. I thank you for their patience with their long-winded pastor. I pray that you be in their hearts this week, and this story holds some kind of resonance to them, and they think about it long and hard and think about who they could be in you. I ask that you bless each person here, each person listening online, and that you be the God that you've always promised to be to them and their faith in you grows. I ask you, Lord, in this and that you keep them safe and sound until we meet again. In your precious name, amen. What does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? Justice, kindness, walk humbly with your God. To justice and love kindness and walk humbly with your God to seek justice and love kindness and walk humbly with your God